Please open your Bibles tonight to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off there the other day, last Sunday. If you were here, you may remember that in the first part of this chapter, Jesus was teaching uh, a lesson through a parable and uh, about wealth and how a man was so focused on his wealth, he was missing out on the blessings and he, he, he was blessed a great deal and he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've been blessed so much. I don't know where to put all the abundance of my crops. So I'm going to have to tear down my barns, build bigger ones. I, I'm going to store it up and then I'm going to tell you my soul, just lean back, take it easy and rest. And God said to him, he was a fool because that very night his soul was going to be required of him. He was not going to have any longer to live to enjoy the things he thought he was. But then Jesus went on. He was talking to a crowd when he said that. And then he turned in tonight's passage. It says he spoke to his disciples beginning in verse 22. And he talks tonight about worrying. I don't know if maybe none of you are worriers. But if you're like me, you know some folks who are. I know some people who are not happy unless they're worrying about something. If there's nothing to worry about, they're worried about that. They say, I, don't, I just must be something I don't know about. I'm going to until I find out. I'm going to worry, worry, worry until I find out what it is. And most of those people that are worriers like that, they're pessimists. Have you ever noticed that? They, they're always looking for the worst in things. Well, most of you know that I don't have a lot of, well, you know, don't know why I don't have a lot of bad habits. I do have one that I admit to, and that's I like to go fishing. I don't say call it catching, I call it fishing because that's, I do a lot more with fishing than I do catching, but you've got to be an optimist if you're going to be a fisherman. I mean, if, if you're going to go at next cast, whew, no, he didn't get it then, but he's, he's waiting, maybe he's over here. Next cast, I'm, I know, I'm looking at some fishermen and y'all know what I'm talking about. You're optimistic that just one more cast, I'm going to catch that big one, the one I can mount on the wall or take home and eat or whatever it is. You're an optimist. A pessimist, he's not going. No, he, he's not going to get up any earlier to go out with you. He's not going to stay out late. Well, fish are not going to bite today anyway. Last time I went, all I did was sit there and, you know, he's a pessimist. Or he's worried. Well, if I do go, skeeters might bite me and I don't want to get involved in that. I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that. People worry about all kinds of things. You, know, you don't have to be a pessimist to be a worrier, but a lot of people do worry. And, and there's certain things that we find in common that we worry about when we are worrying. We're worrying about relationships with people. You know, one thing about relationships with others, they're either going to get better or they're going to get worse or they're going to stay about the same. So why do we worry about it? Doesn't mean we don't do anything about it to improve relationships, but we don't worry about that. We shouldn't. And we worry about our health sometimes. Some folks worry all the time about their health. They worry so much about their health to make themselves sick. That can be true. Why do you worry about your health? Are you going to get better because you've worried? Hmm. People worry about their finances, they, they worry about their employment, about their job, and sometimes that's something that you really need to be thinking about and considering, but worrying has never made a better employer or a better employee, has never put more money in the bank because you worried. It never paid the bills better because you worried. Worry doesn't fix anything. He said, well, I'm not worried about any of those things, but if you start talking about our government, I'm worried. You start talking about the condition of our nation, I'm worried. Can you fix it? Will worrying fix it? Or are there certain things you can do besides worrying that can help? Can you pray for your country? Can you vote right when the time comes? Can you encourage others? There's actions you can take in addition to just worrying because worrying doesn't solve anything. Say, well, I'm not really a worrier, but I'll study the problem. I'm going to identify the problem. That's a good thing to do. That's positive. To try to find a solution, that's a constructive thing when worrying is not. Well, God gives us an option to worrying in tonight's passage, and I'd like for you to look at it. Maybe you're not a chronic worrier, but maybe you say, oh, I'm going to jot this down to somebody I need to share this with. I know a worrier that really needs some help. In Luke chapter 12, verse 22, 
And he, being Jesus, said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life which you shall eat, neither for the body which you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. When he says take no thought, that doesn't mean don't think about it. It means don't worry about it. Stop worrying, literally is what he's saying, for your life and what you shall eat. Now he's not saying don't take care of your body or don't take care of your health, but he's saying don't worry about it. He's not saying don't pay attention to what you eat because we need to pay attention to what we eat. Most nutritionists tell us we need a balanced diet of fruits and vegetables and meats and so forth and you count your carbs and your calories and your proteins and all these things, trying to be healthy and eat right. Well, sometimes you can worry yourself to death over counting those things and not getting it lined up quite right. But food is a basic need and we do need to have a good diet. It's kind of interesting. I know two men who are about the same age and, and both of them are extremely healthy. I mean, very healthy men. One man is a vegan. He doesn't touch meat at all. And the other man doesn't touch vegetables. And really, you get around them, they're just as healthy as they can be. I eat them both, I get fat. I don't understand that. We do need to pay attention to what we eat. It's important. God has designed this body to consume things, to make it function properly. So he's not saying don't even think about what you eat. He's saying, don't worry about it. God has designed our bodies to consume food. I don't think he... Well, you might be able to live on nothing but boudin and cracklings and donuts, but not as long as if you ate other things. <laughs> you see, but that's what I love most of all. I saw a picture the other day on one of the internet things. I don't remember which one it was. It was one of them, and it, it, was, it looked like a hamburger, a great tall one. And actually what it was, was two donuts with the meat patty and cheese and onions and lettuce and tomatoes. Instead of a bun, it had two big old greasy looking glazed donuts. And I said, I don't even know what they call that thing. The guy says, oh, this is delicious. People eat strange things. But Jesus says, don't be worrying about what you eat. He didn't say don't eat wisely because we need to. He says, neither be worrying for the body, what you're going to put on. Most of us don't worry a lot about what we wear. We pick out what we like. In the wintertime, we try to put on something warm. In the summertime, we try to dress with something cool. And most of us, if we're out in public, we kind of like to look nice. Now, some people just don't really give a rip. You know, they say, hey, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to dress however I want to. If they don't like the way I'm dressed, well, they can look at somebody else. But most of us do. You know, we don't have to run around with coats and ties and high heel shoes and all those things. Uh, if y'all know me and you know me fairly well, Sunday's about the only time you see me like this. The rest of the time, I'm like the rest of you. I don't blue jeans and a shirt and try to be clean and neat and be pressed, but... How do we dress? Is it really all that important? And the answer is yes, it is. Should we not just dress for the weather and the temperature, but we should dress modestly, ladies. Men are not nearly as big of a problem, but ladies need to dress modestly. And I know we've got an older crowd of ladies here tonight. Teach the younger ones, please. And as I go through the Walmart and I go through the mall and I see some of the women, I said, good gracious lady, did you just buy a can of spray paint or what? This is horrible. And nobody ever told them, ma'am, I'm sorry, that does not look good. You, if you covered up, it'd look a lot better. But that's the world we live in right now. Now, you can go shopping wherever you choose. You, you can buy your clothes at Neiman Marcus or Walmart or Goodwill. That doesn't really matter. But don't let your wardrobe control your thinking. Don't be worried about it, okay? Use some logic and some thinking. Don't let your wardrobe be in control. And that's what he's saying. Don't worry about what you're going to put on. There's more important things to consume your time than worrying about that. In verse 23 it says, The life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Some, sometimes I think, sometimes I, think I, I, I live to eat and sometimes I eat to live. <laughs> have, have you ever, have you, am I the only one who ever does this? Here it is Sunday, I think, what am I going to have for supper tomorrow night? David does, I can tell you, this day, both of them, both, the two Davids over here, both of them doing the same thing, yep, yep, yep. I don't know why it is. 
But there's something about food that attracts us to where, does it really matter that we plan this far in advance? I don't know. I guess if you're cooking, it does, but most of us aren't cooking. We're just thinking about food as an attraction for us. But we don't need to have a fixation on food because it can become an addiction. It can turn into gluttony. And if we go too far in that direction, it winds up being obesity and even to the point that it's morbidly obese and it's deadly. As somebody once said, when somebody gets to that point in their life that they're committing suicide with a fork and a spoon, it happens. And it's a terrible thing. It's like any other addiction. It's horrible to break it because it's not illegal. And you're only hurting yourself. I feel sorry for people like that. It, it's a battle that I've fought my whole life, ever since I was a little round child. I was round. Oh, believe me, I was round, very round. And it was just one of those things. Life is more than food, more than meat, and the body is more than raiment, more than clothing. What we wear is important. How we treat our bodies in regard to nutrition, exercise, rest, all of that is important. We need to pay attention to it, but should we worry about it? There's a big difference in paying attention to it and using our intellect to make right choices and decisions, but that and worry? He says, don't worry about that. Verse 24 says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouses nor barns, and God feeds them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? <laughs> Those birds, they don't plant crops. They don't harvest them. They don't build barns to store the grain in. God didn't design them that way. They can't do it. But we could, and we should work for our living. We should work for what we eat. You say, well, birds don't have to work. Did you ever watch birds? Yes, they do work for it. Did you ever watch them try to dig up worms? Did you ever watch them try to pick up the seeds? Hey, sometimes they work pretty hard to eat. But they do it in the right way. They don't try to do something they're not designed to do. They do all that they have to do, and God provides the rest. He'll, add, he'll bring a flock of birds right to the right spot where that particular grain is that they like. So, some of you are goose hunters. Did you ever notice how those geese can find a rice field? I mean, they're 1,000 feet in the air. Next thing you know, that rice field is covered with 1,000 birds out there eating rice. How'd they find that? God leads them to it, right to where they need to be. And when they get there, they eat their fill. But as far as we know, birds don't worry. They don't. They just... Take, go by the instinct that God gives them. They don't worry about things. They don't have anxieties. They don't have ulcers. They don't have panic attacks. They just take what God has put into them and they go find their food and they eat. And God provides for them. There's no need for a bird to worry. And God loves the birds, obviously, or He wouldn't be creating them that way and providing for them that way. But the big point that Jesus is trying to make is He loves you and me more than He loves the birds. So why do we worry about those things? We're worth more to God than the bird. Why do we worry? Some people say, well, I, I don't really worry about that stuff, but uh, I'm just trusting God. But, well, yeah, maybe I do worry about it. And, so they, and then they finally admit, well, I'm trusting God and I am worrying about this subject or that subject. Maybe not food or clothing or something else. That, But there's something that's troubling you. And so you say, I'm trusting God, but I'm still worrying about it. When you're worrying about something and trusting God at the same time, you know what you're doing? You're pulling on the same rope from both directions, from both ends. How far do you move it? You don't. All you do is wear yourself out. You exhaust yourself. So let me encourage you tonight. If you are worrying about anything at all, whatever it is you're worrying about, God can handle it. Amen. Trust Him. Just say, God, I'm going to give it over to you. I don't have a need that's so big you can't take care of it. I'm going to stop worrying about it. I'm going to stop worrying about it. I am going to stop. I'm going to stop worrying about it. I keep saying it over. I'm going to stop worrying about it. God, help me stop worrying about it. I'm trusting you. It may be a long, lengthy process that you lay it down at the Lord's feet and say, Now, Lord, I'm trusting you to take care of it. And then tomorrow you get up in the morning and there it is. You got it back in your hands again. 
I gave it to you yesterday, Lord, but I'm worried about it again today. I'm going to bring it back to you. Sometimes we go through that again and again and again. But God says it's okay. Stop worrying about it. Keep bringing it to me until finally you get to the point you no longer pick it up. You realize I've got it. I've got it under control. So we need to just trust God because trusting Him helps solve the problems that are troubling us when worry never does. Look how Jesus explains this in verse 25. He says, And which of you, with taking thought, can add to the stature one cubit? And if you then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take you thought for the great or for the rest? Can you make yourself taller by worrying about it? I, I don't know, probably a lot of guys growing up wanted to be taller when they were growing up, particularly if they were the short kid in the class, because everybody picked on him. He was short, and, but he wanted to be taller, wanted to be taller, wanted to be taller. And as try as much as he could, he was the same height. He didn't grow. He didn't grow as fast as he wanted to. He never got to be the tall guy in class. Because you can worry about it all you want to, but that's not going to change your height, is it? And worrying is not going to add an hour to your life either. As a matter of fact, it may even take an hour away. So we need to stop worrying and just trust God. If worrying is not, does not enable us to be bigger or live longer, why do we worry? Verse 27, Jesus goes on and gives them another example. He says, consider the lilies. First he talked about the birds. He says, now just look at the flowers. How they grow, they toil not, they spin not. Yet I say unto you that Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest, most wealthy man in the world in his day, was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? We can see how God is providing for just the wildflowers. And this time of year, the spring is beautiful, wildflowers everywhere. And we look at those and say, they didn't do anything to deserve that. God just put them there. God put the nourishment in the soil. He put the rain on them and, and put the sunshine on them. And, and God's just doing it for them. He's, he's providing for the wildflowers. Well, if He's able to do that and He cares that much about them, how much does He care about us? Aren't we worth more than that? Maybe it'll help you stop worrying when you realize God does love you a lot more than He loves a bird or a wildflower. Continue on. Verse 29. And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. The word seek here is zito in the Greek language, and it means more than just look for something. It means to actively pursue it. It means to get totally focused on the pursuit to the point that that's all you are looking at. You can't see anything else, no peripheral vision. I mean, you are focused on that. As I read this and I studied it and I thought about that word, I, I thought about Heidi. Now, see, if you don't live around my house, you don't know about Heidi. Heidi is one of the two dogs we've got in our backyard. We've got two dogs. One of them is an orange dog, and it's a big, tall designer mutt. And, and it's uh, part border collie and something else, German Shepherd. Just a big, happy-go-lucky puppy. Just runs all over the place. But Heidi, Heidi's the older of the two dogs, and she's mostly Bassett and some Jack Russell Terrier. Have you all got a, a vision of what she looks like? Short, heavy, stocky, but she's a hunter. It's inbred in her. She hunts. And she stays in the backyard, but if she get out, gets out of the gate, she's gone. I'm, and we live in town. That nose goes down, and she starts running a zigzag path. She is on the hunt. She doesn't know what she's hunting for, but she's hunting. It's inbred. She can't help it. That's seeking. She does not look up for cars, traffic, or anything else. She's hunting. She's seeking. She is pursuing Zeta. It's, it's that same word right here. I, you can call her name. It doesn't matter. You can threaten to shoot her. It doesn't matter. She's focused. She is absolutely seeking to the point of worship or religion. Nothing else matters at that point in that time for that dog. And that's the word Jesus was talking about here. Sometimes we get like that. 
Sometimes we get so focused on a particular need, the rest of the world just kind of goes off in a blur somewhere. We don't even see it. We don't think about it. He said, neither be of a doubtful mind. Quit chasing that to the point of worship and don't doubt God's ability to provide what you need. Quit focusing on the ground in front of you where you're hunting like Heidi does and start looking up to God Almighty because He is able. He knows what you need. He is surrounding you with everything that you need and He loves you. Shift your focus. It helps a great deal. Now, if you're a chronic worrier, and if you're one of those people who just has to have something to worry about and you're not going to be happy unless you're worrying about something, I'm going to give you something worthwhile. Worry about where you're going to spend eternity. Now, you want something worthwhile? Now, that's important. That's more important than anything you're going to wear, anything you're going to eat, any job you're going to have, whatever you've got in the bank account. It's more important than anything else because everything else you worry about is temporary. But where you're going to spend eternity, that's not temporary. That's eternal. So if you're going to worry, worry about that. Now, I know on a Sunday night crowd, we're probably almost all Christian. Maybe you settled that issue a long, long time ago and said, well, I'm not worried about that anymore. I was. I was until one day somebody told me, Alan, you're a sinner. You need to be saved. Okay, what do you, what do you mean saved? Saved from what? Saved from the fires of hell. Why do I want to worry about that? Because that's the price that's paid by sinners unless they're forgiven. I want to be forgiven. How are you forgiven? Trust Jesus as your Savior and Lord. He came and died on a cross to pay for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. He's alive right now. He can save you. And so you put your faith and trust in Him, and you find out He does save you. He changes your heart. He changes your mind. He changes your focus and your direction. You're not the same person anymore, and you don't worry about hell anymore. Right. You've stopped worrying about your eternal destiny and where you're going to spend eternity because your faith is in Jesus, and He never fails. Now that you can do. And you say, what am I going to do then? I'm a worrier. If I'm not worried about that, what am I going to do with my time? Worry about where somebody else is going to spend their eternity. Worry about the person sitting next to you. Worry about the one you're married to. Worry about your children. Where are they going to spend eternity? Worry about the people that you work with. If you have to worry about something or somebody, look at somebody in the mall and say, I wonder where that person's going to spend eternity. Start praying for them the moment you begin to worry. And you're going to find your focus is going to shift. It's not going to be a worry anymore. It's going to be a concern. A genuine concern that you're trying to do something about because you're praying. See, worry doesn't take action. Worry just worries. But the concern takes action. So let me encourage you tonight. If you're somebody that just has to worry if you're not worried about where you're going to spend eternity because you've already trusted Jesus as your Savior, then be concerned about somebody else. But you say, well, I've never trusted Jesus, but I'm not worried about where I'm going to spend eternity. You need to be. You need to be because without Him, you will not see heaven, period. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's it. There is no second chance, no other option. Maybe we need to worry more or less. Instead of worrying about temporary things, here's the option. Look at verse 31. Seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. All of the things that you've been worrying about, they'll fall in line. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And as a matter of fact, Matthew in the 6th chapter says almost exactly the same thing, but not quite. The 33rd verse says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then it's got this little phrase added in there, And His righteousness. Seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You put God first. You seek Him first. Foremost, above everything else you've been seeking in your life, Seek Him first and His kingdom and His righteousness. And everything else is going to get in its proper place. 
when we seek Him, how do we do it? How do we seek God? How do we seek His righteousness? How do we seek His kingdom? You begin seeking it in prayer. If you want to put Him first, you put Him first in the morning. First thing. You spend time with Him in prayer. First thing. Oh, you may be one of those people that needs an altar that you kneel down in front of and with the Bible open and, and whatever else you have there in order to get you to focus on praying. And if so, that's fine for you. But somebody else says, all i got to do is get my feet out of that bed on the floor and I'm praying. Hallelujah for you. There's not a definite right or wrong formula. It's a matter of communicating your heart to God and getting Him first in line for everything you're going to face during the course of the day. Saying, dear God, I surrender to you today. Yes. Dear God, I want to live my life your way today. Dear God, I pray that you'll put the whole armor of God upon me today. Wrap me up. Gird my loins with truth. Put the breastplate of righteousness on me. Put the helmet of salvation on my head. I'm going to be in a spiritual war. I sense it today. Dear God, put the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God in my hand. Hide me behind the shield of faith. And oh, dear God, I'm praying for victory. Maybe that's the way you need to start your day each day. Spiritual war, we're in it. So what do we do? We seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. How do you do that? How do you find His righteousness? You can't find His righteousness without finding Him. If we don't have the righteousness of God and we're not part of the kingdom of God, we're, we're lost. We're undone. We, we've wasted our whole lives. And so we are to seek those things. If we're worrying about where we're going to spend eternity. If we're worrying about seeking the kingdom of God and, and we're worrying about how we're going to get there and how we're going to have God's righteousness, I've got to tell you how to do it. If you want to find out how to find the kingdom of God for yourself, you find the king first. You find the king. As a matter of fact, He's the King of all kings. You find the Lord Jesus. And when you find Him and you focus on Him and you trust Him and you bow down before Him and you submit to Him, I'm going to tell you something. All these other words are going to begin to disappear. You're going to say all of a sudden, you know, that stuff doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter anymore what I'm going to eat tomorrow if I eat tomorrow because I may not even be here tomorrow. And if I'm not, I'm going to be with you, Jesus. I'm in your kingdom. I'm trusting you as my Lord, my Savior, and my King. And that's where it happens. When we get to that point in our lives, worry can become a thing of the past. Oh, Brother Allen, you don't know about financial worries. What, you think I live on a different planet? Of course I know about financial worries. I know what a paycheck looks like, and I know what light bills look like. I know what it costs to feed families. Just like you, we live in the same place. But I'm going to tell you something. Many, many years ago, Pat and I had not been very married very, very long. God taught me to quit worrying about money. And I don't. I'm not saying I don't pay any attention to it. I'm not saying it's not important. I don't worry about money. Somebody said, I'd love to know your secret about that one. Real simple. I found out it's not mine. <laughs> Whatever I've got in my pocket, it doesn't belong to me. Whatever I've got in the bank, it doesn't belong to me. Whatever bills I've run up, they're not mine. I got to be careful what kind of bill I run up for God because it's His bill, it's His money. It all belongs to Him. And when we realize we are just stewards and we trust Him, saying, Oh, King, King of all kings, thank you for letting me be a steward of whatever it is, <laughs> this amount. Show me what to do with it. It's yours. I just want to do it your way. And as long as I'm realizing I'm doing my best to please Him, I quit worrying. Found I never had to worry. We've never missed any meals around our house. There's always been something to eat. Oh, I can remember back in early days when we were in the military. Times were tough. I mean, they were so tough, we definitely run out of money and out of food before we ran out of pay days before payday. But every single time that happened, God provided. We get a check in the mail from somebody who says, you know, God just told me to send you this $50. It's 
or a neighbor would come over with a casserole and said, I just thought you might like this. I've been telling the truth. This happened again and again. You can ask Pat if you think a preacher's lying. Ask her. She doesn't. <laughs> and I don't lie either. I mean, I stretch a fishing story every now and then, but this is the truth. God provides when you trust him and realize it's his. You get it all in order. You seek his righteousness and his kingdom, and you seek him. And everything else falls into place. And after that, all you do is just follow him and are obedient to him. If you've never done that, I, I want to encourage you to do that tonight. If you're struggling with worry over anything, give it to the Lord and say, Dear God, I want to trust you instead of worrying about this. This worrying stuff is no fun. I'd rather be able to trust you and rejoice knowing you've got it under control. And if we're talking about where you're going to spend eternity, start there. But if you've not already settled that issue, start there with the Lord tonight. Trust Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice tonight that you are so good to us. And Lord, even as Jesus pointed out to his disciples when he pointed at the birds and at the flowers and realizing how insignificant they are, and yet you provide everything they need. You're perfectly capable of providing everything we need to, whether it's physical, material, whether it's emotional, whether it's mental, no matter what it is. Oh, dear God, help us to trust you and trust you completely and take away the worries. Replace them with faith in you. And Father, I pray that if there's even one person here tonight who's never put all their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, they will right now. You'll hear them. If they just cry out to you and say, Oh, dear God, forgive me. I'm a sinner and I've broken your commandments. I need to be saved. If they'll just admit that to you and ask Jesus to come into their heart and save them tonight, He will do it immediately. I know He will. He promised He would. Father, if somebody's like that here tonight, hear their prayers. Help them to pray. And Father, for those of us that carry burdens, and we all do, we've all got concerns and Father, we don't like to admit it, but there are things we do worry about trying to figure out how in the world we're going to solve this problem or that. Help us, Lord, to cast all of our cares upon you because you do care for us. Have your way now, Father. As Christians, draw us closer to you that we might be walking testimonies of your great love and your power. Thank you, Father. Thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.